All right, so I'm going to get started. Thank you guys for making it today, this morning. I'm sure the tabloid was an extra draw, but now you're here, so now I have you as my captive audience. So my name is Lynn. Um, as Steve said, thank you guys so much for the hospitality. I've gotten a great, great Australian welcome, um, and it's a really big pleasure to be here. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about the organization I work for, which is a nonprofit based in San Francisco. Uh, I tend to talk really fast when I'm giving talks. If I'm doing that, if someone from the audience could just motion for me to, yeah? <laughs> Do Australians talk fast? Oh, okay. All right, good. So you guys are perfect. My, my perfect audience. Oh, hey. That sounds like a challenge. Um, all right. So, um, so Code for America, so that, yeah, that's, um, that's a hashtag you guys can use. That's our Twitter. And um, what I want you to do, um, if you can humor me during my talk, is if you can just think to your own communities. So I think there are people here. Who's from Melbourne? Sydney? What about the Gold Coast? Oh, cool. All right. So and anywhere else? Brisbane. 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 OK. Sorry. Forgot the other Queensland spot. So, um, so what I'd like you to do um, during my presentation, you know, as minds tend to wander, is if you can just think about uh, your own local government and kind of what your interactions are with your own local government um, and then think about how they are and then think about what you'd like them to be um, and then if you can think about what role you could play in actually making that government the government you would like to see. Uh, you know, we have a democratic system here just like in the U.S. It's not perfect, but um, it's what we have. And um, so I'd like you to think about that because that's a really big part of our work is thinking about you know, how citizens and government can work together to actually make government work the way that we want it to work. Um, so Code for America was founded um, with this idea of technology being something that is very present in the private sector but seems to be lacking in the way we want it to work in the public sector. So here's a good example. So this is what actually comes up when you Google government technology um, in the US. Right? So <laughs> this is not a good sign. Right? Like, this is bad. This is not good. And um, the reason why this is not a good sign is because people associate government technology with things being inefficient, being clunky, um, being unusable, so not working for everyday citizens. And this isn't just a problem for government, but it's also a problem for citizens, right? Because if government is using a ton of money to spend on huge IT projects, that's money that they don't have to you know, build cool trams, which the Gold Coast just got, or on public school, or on you know, fixing potholes, or whatever the biggest problems are in your community. And so Code for America thought, OK, we have all of this innovation happening in the private sector. We have all of these very, very talented technologists, um, but they're not wanting to work in government. That's, not, that's just not happening naturally. It's not kind of an environment that seems to really attract the most talented technologists. They're kind of you know, different beasts. So what would it look like if the talent of the technology community was actually contributing to government? And the reason why we did that and the reason why we started to think about that is because Code for America believes the government can work by the people, for the people in the 21st century. So a lot of people have problems with just that first sentence, right? Government can work. Like I probably lost like a lot of people in the room <laughs> just with that first sentence. But I actually really believe that. Um, and I hope that that is true because government is so important to provide all of these different services that people really need. And so if it doesn't work, we're kind of in big trouble unless we want to go the anarchist route, which I'm, there might be advocates for, but I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole right now. Um, and so what we did um, with this idea in mind is we started the fellowship program. And the fellowship program, actually, let me back up for a second. Who here has heard of Code for America before? Oh, wow, awesome. OK, so if there's anything that you guys want to contribute, you know, just let me know. And the fellowship program is this idea of Peace Corps for Geeks. So you know, Peace Corps is this US program. It sends people to other countries. So what if we thought of Peace Corps or something like Teach for America, and we paired talented technologists, and we brought them to work with local city governments, and we had them work together for a year. Right? So talented designers, technologists, we train them in things like user-centered design. Um, we work with the city government partner on understanding how digital technology could help to benefit their actual work in their cities. Um, and then we put them together for a year of service. And what I really appreciate and what I love about our fellows is that um, they're not just complaining about something, they're actually working to fix it. 
So they really care about making communities a better place and they want to put their skills to good use in government. And so we started with the fellowship program and um, it's about a year or so, which I think I might have mentioned. And so this is one of our fellows, this is Max Ogden and he is a very, very talented open source developer. So he's done a lot of great work and a lot of you know, very, very civic-minded projects. Um, but So Max was paired with the city of Boston, which is on the East Coast, and they were supposed to fix the public school system in the States. They were supposed to work to create a better kind of technology system for public school, and I'll get more into that later. Um, but there was a problem with Max, which is that he had no idea how to tie a tie. Like, absolutely no clue. But that's really the point of the fellowship program, is that you're bringing together people who otherwise wouldn't work together. So you're bringing together someone like Max with a lot of government people, and a lot of government people who don't really understand necessarily the work that Max is doing, who have very different skills, um, but who still care about making their community a better place. So Max and another fellow, they were paired with the city of Boston, and as I mentioned, they were paired with the city of Boston to try to work on fixing the public education system. Um, so the public education system in the States, I don't know if you guys are familiar at all with it, but it's a really, really flawed system. So we have um, notoriously bad public education, and um, especially for you know, vulnerable groups, it's very, very difficult for them to access quality education. And so the Boston Fellows, they were supposed to work with the city to try to make that better. And um, they came in and they found out that the city of Boston was having parents choose their um, kids' public school by using this, which is a 38-page uh, PDF document. And yeah, <laughs> that is exactly the reaction I was hoping for, like what the heck. So this document um, is incredibly confusing, right? It um, doesn't really work for parents. Like parents look at this and they have no idea how to figure out what's important to them. And it's a really, really complicated lottery system in the US. And so you have to be able to pick what are the things that are most important to you and then kind of filter those in a way so you're actually choosing the right school for your kid. And this is one of those things, like this isn't, this isn't where are we gonna go to dinner tonight? This isn't, you know, what's, what's the plan for tomorrow? Like this is your kid's future. This is your, your, where your kid is going to receive their education. And so the fellows came in and the idea was, you know, they're supposed to use technology to try to solve this problem. Um, but the city was very, very worried about releasing the data. Um, it's politically sensitive. There's all this information about kind of school rankings, about certain quality levels, um, and it was very political in nature, right? And understandably, you know, the city also has its own interests to protect, and that's a reality of our political system. And so the fellows were really struggling, and they were trying to get this to work, and then the Boston Globe actually ran an article about it, and they said, why is it so hard for parents to choose their kid's school? And they criticized the mayor's office, they criticized the city government for not making it easier for people to be able to choose a school for their kid. Um, and that really paved the way for the fellows to get involved. And what I like about this story is that I think that it shows how um, all of the different players have a role to play. So how the media can actually you know, serve as an advocate um, and then how technologists can do something. And I'll show you what they did in a minute. Um, and then also too, just understanding kind of what the city government priorities might be and constraints. So that really also paved the way. There were a lot of government partners who actually really wanted to give them the data, but they were struggling to do it because there were all of these political barriers. So they um, ended up opening up the data um, and the fellows built this. So this is called Discover BPS. And um, what Discover BPS does, does anyone here use like Kayak or Airbnb? Yeah, so yeah, I use those all the time. Um, and what this is, it's like a very, very simple way for parents to go in, they can you know, say what are the things that are most important to them. Do they care about the school being walking distance away? Do they care about there being diversity? You know, maybe it's a child who is from um, a very you know, kind of small minority class and they want to make sure there are people like them in that school. So all of these different factors, they put those all into this interface and gave parents a really, really easy way to navigate the political system, to navigate the education system, and to be able to choose the right school for their kids. Um, and what I like about this example is that um, I think it's really indicative of the work that Code for America is trying to do. Um, and this was a quote by one of the fellows who said, and I'm going to read it out loud even though you guys are perfectly capable of reading it, which says, I'm coding for America because I believe that interfaces to government can be simple, beautiful, and easy to use. So if you think about all of the ways that you would like to interact with your own government, 
how much better would that be if all of the interfaces were like this? Simple, beautiful, and easy to use. Um, and that's really what we're trying to do. Um, and one thing that is also really interesting to me about this story is that, um, so we talked to the city of Boston and we asked them, you know, if you tried to do this on your own, um, how much do you think it would have cost you? And they said that it would have likely cost them um, $2 million and taken two years to do. Which is just, I mean, it's crazy. Like, that's a lot of money that could go to something else. And I think it just shows how the current system is really difficult for politicians to navigate and what a difference it can make when you connect different types of people together to work outside the system in a new and innovative way. Um, so this is my city. This is San Francisco. Um, this is where I'm from. Who's been to San Francisco? Steve has. Yeah, we, we got lots of drinks in San Francisco. Um, so. So this is um, the city where I was born and raised, and my um, family has actually been, this is Bernal Heights Hill, which in my opinion has the best view in San Francisco. And my family's been there since 1968, which I think says something about my upbringing. And this is a real piano that's there. And you guys have probably been hearing about San Francisco a lot, but not uh, for the reason I'm going to tell you. You guys have probably been hearing you know, about all the tech boom and everything that's been going on and how there's so much cool stuff happening there, which is great. That creates lots of jobs. Um, but what it's also done is made the city extraordinarily expensive. So San Francisco right now, to give you an idea, one bedroom apartment is about $2,400 a month. And that's you know, kind of a small one bedroom. So, a lot of people who are from San Francisco, a lot of people who've been living there for years, uh, they're having a really, really hard time making ends meet. And um, the city um, is trying to do what it can. So, you know, we have a food stamp program, and that food stamp program, um, it's kind of given to people on a little card, and people are able to go to the supermarket, and so they can swipe it just like a credit card, right? So people don't have to know that someone's using food stamps. It's, it's embarrassing. No one wants someone else to know they've hit hard times. And the um, we started to partner with the city of San Francisco with their um, Health and Human Services Agency. And um, three fellows were working with them. And they were trying to start to figure out like what is going on with the uh, food stamp program. Because one third of people were losing their benefits. Like every month, a third of the people who were on food stamps, who were eligible to be on them, were losing them. And the fellows found out that the city was using this to communicate with them, right? So I'm sure you guys can kind of see parallels between this and the Discover BPS example. Like this is not an easy document for people to understand. But not only that, um, they were doing this by mail. And so the city was actually sending people, you know, notices when they were about to lose their food stamps. But uh, people who are having trouble making ends meet aren't always living in the same place from month to month. So the fellows found out that that's what was happening and people were moving a lot. They went out into the community. Actually, one of the fellows um, even enrolled in food stamps himself and kind of went through the process of seeing what was happening. And I think this is a great example of user research, of thinking about what is actually happening out there. And the fellow figured out, you know, this isn't a question. This is a question of people not getting the information that they actually need. And um, so, they, so they actually built um, this application called Promptly. So they worked with the city. The city opened up a bunch of data, a bunch of information about who was actually receiving food stamps. Um, and they built a text messaging application, right? And so I want you to just picture kind of two scenarios. And one of them is a you know, family goes to the supermarket and they have all of their food and they are ready to check out. And then they go to use their card and it doesn't work. And they have that like moment of just terrible embarrassment and having to actually, not, not only that, but then having to put the food back that they were going to buy for their family. And now with this, 80% of people who were going to lose their benefits are now getting re-enrolled. So it's a very simple, it's not complicated. Like and it, the point is that it doesn't have to be complicated, it just has to work. And so this works because it sends people an SMS text message, it tells them when they are going to lose their food stamps, and then people are able to very easily re-enroll. And that's the point of the program, so that people who actually need it can use it. Uh, but one thing that we also realized at Code for America was that uh, there were a lot of people who wanted to get involved, but they um, didn't want to spend a whole year 
right? So like everyone, ha people have lives. Like you guys are all probably, you know, set in the places where you live. You might have families, you know, you have a community. Um, and a lot of times people wanted to actually do work in the communities where they live. Uh, but we didn't really have a way, we didn't know what to do with that. Like we'd get all these kind of inbound requests of people who are like, yeah, you know, I'd really love uh, to do something in my city or in my small town or something along those lines. But, you know, I really don't have time to do a whole year-long fellowship program. Um, and so we started a program called the Brigade Program. And what the Brigade Program does is it organizes people, so it helps them to find each other, and people form their own local chapter. So someone signs up to lead it, and then they say, you know what, I want to work and use my own skills. Those can be technology skills, those can be people who are policy activists and want to work on open data. There's like a lot of different pieces to this, right? Um, but I want to do this in my own community. And so what we started to do is we created an organizing structure where people can find, them, can find people near them in their own communities, and then they can connect to each other, and they've started to organize these groups who are actually working jointly with local government representatives. So local government are coming to their hack nights. Like in Code for San Francisco, we have a weekly hack night, and someone from the Mayor's Office of Innovation comes to our hack night, and they work on, for example, affordable housing in San Francisco. So they're doing all these mappings, like where is there not affordable housing? Where is there affordable housing? How is this working out? Um, and what's, uh, what we also saw is that not only people in the states wanted to do this, we started getting questions from people in other places. So people you know, from all over the world who also kind of had seen this gap in innovation between the private sector and the public sector and really, really wanted to make a difference and actually work on that. Um, so we started to partner with them. So Code for America started to work with other organizations. We opened up the brigade program. We actually have, um, there are now 36 brigades um, in 11 different countries. Um, and then there are also groups that are organizing brigades locally in their own communities. So for example, uh, Code for Australia. Alvaro, can you raise your hand for a second? So Alvaro is from Code for Australia. They're going to be organizing brigade programs. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And um, Code for Germany, for example, has organized 13 brigades. Um, and these are a, just kind of a handful of groups that wanted to get started. Um, and I wanted to give you some examples because what I think is cool is how um, in other places people are doing things that make sense for their own countries. So has anyone here been to Mexico? Yes. All right, vamos Mexico. So they have, so Mexico, one thing about Mexico is that they have a ton, a ton of taxis, right? So they have a lot of different taxis um, and they also have a lot of fake taxis. So for example, when I went to Mexico City, I didn't want to hail a taxi on the street because there are taxis that are registered and then there are taxis you know, that are safe and have gone through background checks. And I was a female traveling alone and I was really scared to hail a cab on the street because I didn't know if that cab was actually going to be real or fake. And a fake cab hasn't necessarily gone through the background checks, there's no information on them. So a fellow working actually through the Mexico City, they have a government innovation lab, and a fellow working with them um, built this application called Traxi. And what they did was they worked together, the transportation agency opened up its data, and then the fellow built this application where what you can do is you can actually take a picture of the credential number, and then it'll tell you whether or not it's a fake or a registered taxi. It'll also give you rating systems. Do you guys use Yelp here? Yelp. So it also give you rating systems, like with Yelp, like reviews, and say whether or not that cab um, is a kind of highly recommended cab. It'll tell you whether or not a friend of yours has ridden in it. Um, and it solves a real problem of, I want to take a cab, and I don't know if this is a safe one or an unsafe one. And then what, um, what Code for Ireland did, and I think that actually, I think all projects should do this, um, is they used selfies. So they had um, school kids go around and they took geo-referenced pictures of all of the defibrillators in Ireland. And so they all took selfies and then all of the school kids went and they um, uploaded all of them. And that way in Dublin they were able to know where the nearest defibrillators are. So if someone was having a heart attack, they actually had that information. And they could go and they could find the nearest defibrillator. And it was really easy. Like It wasn't a difficult project to implement. And the kids had a ton of fun doing it. And now they have a Lifesaver app from that. So we're actually trying to figure out how to incorporate selfies um, into all of our projects. But we're still working on that. And then um, Code for Germany is a really great example of how a country has really kind of taken the brigade model and made it their own. So in Germany, they call brigades labs, just you know, given the military history. They call them labs, 
And what the labs are doing is that each of the labs are also partnering with local government in Germany. And as I said before, they have 13 labs going. Um, some of the stuff they've done is, for example, they created a uh, nursery finding app. So in Germany, um, the childcare is very, very expensive. And so they were able to create a map of all of the free childcare centers so someone can see where there's the nearest childcare center to where they live and actually use that service. And these are services that already existed, but the problem was that people, people didn't know about them, right? They didn't know how to find them. And so this is kind of just a one quick picture of the international brigades um, and the fact that you know, there are 36 and then there are all of these local kind of you know, different groups who are implementing their own programs, who are running their own brigades. And what we also decided was that we wanted to make sure that all of these local groups were connected. So I was actually talking to some people on the tram about this yesterday, but you know, there's so many projects and things happening all over the world, and it's really hard to know what other people are doing and to know what their projects are. And all of our projects are open source, so anyone can go and take it and use it for their city. So, and then also, you know, people want to find out what's going on somewhere else. Maybe they have a similar problem, maybe a similar technology solution, or maybe someone has figured out, you know, a great way to get a government on board and open their data. It's not, it's not just the technology. And so what we started to do is we figured out, you know, there are all these groups. What would it look like if we connected them all together? And so we founded a program called Code for All, and we convened it with some of the other partners who are working on these projects. And we got them all together. And um, we started having some meetings. Code for Australia participated in those meetings. Um, we also created a GitHub repository, so all of their projects are in one place. Um, and, then we, um, and then we've also created, I don't know if I have a slide on this. We've also created, how can I move to the just regular internet from, I just want to show one thing. Yeah, can I, does it matter? Okay, cool. Okay, cool. It's on. Great. Cool. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Um, and so what I wanted to show you guys is that, um, oh, let's see if I can get this working. So this is um, going to be the Code for All website. It's still a work in progress. But, um, oh, it's not loading. Yeah, bear with me. Cool. So what this does, so these are all of the different kind of code for organizations in different places. And you guys can see, there we are, right, right over here. And what, the, um, what this is, it's powered by an API. And all of the individual groups, um, GitHubs, are all on that API. It also um, shows their blogs. And we're trying to figure out a way to get events up there. And the idea behind this is so that people can see exactly what other people are working on and then connect directly to each other. So, for example, if you scroll down here, and this will be launched pretty soon, you can see all of the different projects that people are working on. Excuse me, I just got my mic off. That people are working on. Does that work? Okay. That people are working on. Cool? Yeah. Okay. That people are working on, and you can see Code for Australia is up there. So anyone who wants to contribute to one of those can actually contribute to it and can see what everyone else is working on in the network. Um, and the other cool thing that we're starting to do is this thing called the Civic Technology Issue Finder. So what that is is that when there are um, certain types of projects, you know, everyone has the type of um, language they like to work in. So we've created tags for all of the different projects throughout the network so that anytime someone wants to collaborate to a specific project, they can actually find it right here in the Civic Tech Issue Finder. Um, and these are all a great, great way for people who just kind of want to do something small but maybe don't have time for a larger con contribution to actually get involved um, in trying to code a better government. Just go back to this. So I wanted to leave you um, with some ways to get involved because I think it's, um, I do really believe that if we all work together, we can actually make government work better. But I don't think that it'll work unless we're contributing. And this is the um, website. The first one's the website for the Code for America Brigade program. Um, as I said before, Code for Australia is, is going to be starting local brigades. So if anyone's interested in getting involved directly with Code for Australia, this is the link to their website. Um, and then you can also see all of the projects that brigades have started uh, down in the third link. And then these are all of the applications that the Code for America fellows have built. And the third one, so again, all open source. Like you guys could literally just take this code and use it in your cities. Um, and then this is a link to the Civic Issue Finder. And you can actually embed that in your own websites if you guys are going to be doing something. And that's it. Thank you.
Any questions? Please don't be shy. Uh, thanks for that. Um, a lot of the examples that you showed there, to me, seems more like IT working around political problems mm -hmm. rather than solving the underlying problems. Um, is there any notion of, of any sort of feedback loop of those underlying political problems being solved? Like, if all schools met certain minimum uh, levels, then you would just pick the closest school. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the San Fran um, uh, rental problem. Yeah. Like, you know, there are political solutions around that. Is mm -hmm. there any sort of feedback or is it, um, you know, uh, band aids over the problem? Yeah, that's such a good question. Uh, should I, you guys picked it up, right? Because it was on the mic, I don't need to repeat. Um, really good, very difficult question, but really, really good question. Um, so, I think that they are, in these types of situations, what we've actually started to do is we've started to, from the work that we've done, these have kind of been tests. A lot of them, it's been like a question of what could this engagement look like, and then we're trying to build off of that. And so what we've actually started to do is um, develop these small training modules that I hope that will get more at the heart of the political problems. They're called, um, we haven't technically released them yet, but they're called the Digital Principles for 21st Century Government. Um, and a lot of them are built on the work that gov.uk did. So gov.uk has done a lot of work um, to try to fix that. Th there are still underlying political problems, but the way that we're thinking about it is um, how can you kind of use the digital to start to move people away from those political problems just because something actually works. And so for example, one of those, some of those principles, I don't remember them all off the top of my head, uh, but the principles are, you know, design um, with not for, or, you know, put your users first. And those are good digital principles, but they're also just good government principles. And so what we're trying to do is to work with government to develop these different training modules um, to kind of work towards those political solutions. But what we've seen is that the political stuff it's, it's really hard, like it's just hard and it's messy, um, which doesn't mean it's not important, but it just means that um, it just kind of takes time and so what we're really doing is trying to create these solutions that work and then um, hopefully making things a little bit better for people in their cities. Um, and then what we've also seen is that actually just kind of the presence of this collaboration can start to get people thinking differently, which actually, in my opinion, is the most impactful part of the program. Like, applications are great and they do, some, you know, and, and some of them work and some of them don't. But in my opinion, like the stuff that really makes a difference is when you have people start to think differently about, you know, oh wait, like maybe I shouldn't spend two billion dollars on this health, like healthcare.gov, which was our project. Maybe I should do things differently. And like, what would those different processes look like? And that seems to help with the political stuff a little bit. But it's challenging. Yeah, I hope that yeah. got to your question. Okay. I had a question, Lynn. Um, yeah. I, uh, just last week, I met the guys from the DAT project. They worked with Max, uh, it was Matthias from Denmark. I think they work with Cove America and um, had a good look at their project and had a good chat to them. And they're funded by, I think, by the Knight Foundation. Yeah. And it just got me thinking, uh, and I noticed this when I was in the US as well, uh, there's a lot of things get funded by foundations in the US. Yeah. It's amazing, actually, when you start digging into it. And from what I can see in Australia, we don't seem to have that same sort of of funding available yeah. to us uh, and I'm just wondering because um, uh, I think funding is really important a lot of things get happen in the US through these amazing absolutely, people absolutely yeah uh, how can uh, is it possible for people outside of the US to access, access this foundation mm -hmm. and if not uh, are you aware of anything in other countries like that that mm. people can access funding yeah, so, I mean, I think the funding piece is really important, and that's been a, a huge, huge challenge for other people. I mean, Google has been a big supporter of other groups. So Google, for example, has supported Code for Japan and Code for Germany. Um, I can't speak to kind of the specific foundations and their, their international work, because I'm, I'm just not familiar with it. I don't want to lead you astray. But um, some examples that I think have been really interesting in other places, Code for Japan, actually, their fellowship program, they're starting a corporate fellowship program where companies are giving people leave. So it's a form of corporate social responsibility, right? Companies are giving um, their like talented people like maybe like six months or something sabbatical as a way to support this type of work and as a way to support government. And the US is trying to implement something similar. So that's a workaround. It's not a direct kind of funding question. Sorry. Yeah. Quickly, 
so America has a culture of philanthropy. I hate that word. And um, and that, that the whole foundation thing is a, is rich people can give money and basically get money back kind of indirectly. So that yeah, every dollar taxes. they put into foundations basically ends up doubling somehow. I don't quite get that. but They get tax write-offs. Yeah, huge tax write-offs. Yeah. So there are absolutely foundations in the US that support global activities. Uh, there's this Gates fella did something or other. And not my, my, <laughs> my father won a, a conservation foundation thing years and years ago and they funded him and sent him all around the world and did all sorts of stuff. So, like, basically, if you, you've got to find out rumours about the foundations, and they'll be there, there'll be foundations in the US that'll be willing to fund things elsewhere, you just got to find them, I guess. Mm -hmm, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, and each foundation, you know, has its different priorities for stuff it wants to fund. So, for example, you know, we get a lot of funding from the Omidyar Network, which is Pierre Omidyar, uh, kind of the, the eBay guy, which is his foundation. They're really into transparency and technology and accountability and how that can work to better improve government, but just in general in society. Um, I know that they do do things abroad. I don't know for sure if, like, Australia is one of their priority countries or, or how they organize. That's just not my area of expertise. I'd, I'd like to make a comment on, on what you yeah. already said in terms of talking about the bandage and how it might actually actually change things. Mm -hmm. I find that, um, just from observation in, in various projects, that once people find a solution, even if it is a band-aid, people indeed do change their mindset, but also the other people involved who used to be the decision makers and completely in control of something, they might be initially scared, but they don't mm -hmm. want to be irrelevant either. So they will adapt um, hmm. and essentially be dragged by the ear <laughs> into the 21st century. And, and maybe it's not the most positive way to engage um, a political, um, you know, political uh, Elected, elected person, but um, you know it definitely gets their attention, yeah. and um, over time they will start thinking about how to actually engage with that rather than trying to destroy it because that clearly hasn't worked. Um, sabotaging the process tends to not to not work in the long run, so working with it tends to work better then, and then over time things adjust. So I think that's definitely the case. So as you said, the mindset is it will shift. Yeah. That's, uh, that's my experience. At yeah. Least. Well, and a lot of times, I mean, the dragging by the ear, a lot of times too, it ends up being a really good PR opportunity for people. So it can create this interesting like cycle of accountability where it's like, oh, you know, look what we did. And then it kind of puts them on the hook for actually doing things differently. And because there's this spirit of collaboration, um, it's, it's imperfect, but it starts to kind of, it's, it's going in the right direction. Are there any other questions? Okay, cool. thank you very much. Thank you.